Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Hello. Hopefully you guys are doing okay. Hopefully you guys had a, uh, a nice weekend. And uh, we are getting ready to go back to work out here. Um, as far as the restaurants opening back up, it's coming. So uh, I've gotten confirmation from several restaurants that they're not going to open back up with 100% capacity. They're going to go limited capacity, but they are going to be opening up, I think, this week some of them so it's gonna be interesting we're gonna see i have a feeling in my area because so many restaurants are gonna open up at the same time it's already i've already got a bunch of calls lined up so we'll see how it goes um welcome to the hvacr videos live stream i uh, if you guys don't already know i'm assuming you do but i do these every monday evening 5 p.m pacific um the whole point of these live streams is to kind of give my family more of my time um, when I started doing these YouTube videos, they consumed me um, because I was addicted to the comments. I was addicted to the numbers. I was addicted to everything. And it was really difficult to not be staring at my phone 24 seven to, um, you know, answer the emails and the questions and everything like that. So, um, hey there, I see Dan Young. You're from Springfield, Missouri. I was actually born in Rolla, Missouri, Dan. Very interesting. Um, I haven't been back there since I was a little kid. I still have family there, but, but anyways, back to, uh, what I was talking about. So I, um, you know, that's the whole point of these streams is, is just try to give it more time for my family. So that way I can focus on all the questions and emails that I get in the stream itself. Thank you very much there, Ralph, for becoming a channel supporter. That is very awesome. Okay. Um, as usual guys, when people throw their support to the channel, I do appreciate it. It is not expected it is not required um, i do this to share the little bit of knowledge that i have with all of you guys um, there are several ways that you guys can support this channel where you don't have to send your money to me okay but there's also ways if you choose to do so you can donate via super chats or become a channel supporter like ralph did there's also a patreon support page but there's other ways too you know the simple way is um 
is when you're watching YouTube, if you don't have the YouTube premium membership, then just simply watch the commercials. If you watch the commercials, then YouTube pays me, okay? They don't pay me a lot, but I get a little bit of something for it. Ray th or Roy, thank you very much for becoming a supporter too. That's awesome. Um, the other way is if you guys are interested or considering purchasing any new tools, you can do so uh, if you find that True Tech Tools has good pricing and you like what they have. You can use my offer code big picture one word, and that will help the channel too because I get a small commission when you guys do that. So, if you guys you know wanted to support the channel, you could do so by simply watching the commercials, um, or by uh, purchasing via my affiliate links with True Tech Tools, which just use the offer code big picture. Okay, um, myself. I don't have YouTube commercials because I'm a YouTube premium member. Now, if you guys are interested in that, I, I get no. I mean. I get a small, com you know, I don't get a small commission, but I, you know, if you're a YouTube premium member, you don't get commercials, but they still do kick back a little bit for every YouTube premium member that watches a video or something like that. You get a small, I don't even know, some minuscule number, but um, anyways, going off on a tangent on that, but really, really appreciate you guys coming in here. Okay. Um, got a couple things that I want to cover as usual, and then I want to get to the chat, talk about what's going on there. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I am done like with this whole virus thing. Uh, Marcus, thank you so very much for that super chat, bud. Again, much appreciated, but not expected. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so this whole virus thing is driving me nuts, right? We have been going crazy. Um, slowly, we've been getting out more and more. We went to our local mountains because they opened up a bunch of the trails last weekend and the week before. Uh, this weekend, we actually had some close family friends come over. That was a trip. It was really interesting. We hung out and barbecued in the backyard you know, I tried to keep our distance and all that stuff, but it was really cool. It was nice to see human people and talk to human people and interact with human people. You know, it just seems kind of silly that we can't, but again, let's not get political. Um, but I'm just ready to get to some sort of normal coming out of this, you know, whatever it's going to be. I just, I want to get on with it. I'm ready to be there. Okay. Um, I'm sure as you guys are too, it's a trip. We're just all ready to come back out of this. So, um, hopefully you guys are safe and healthy. And um, I'm going to look at the chat and see what I'm missing. If you guys have any questions, please post them in caps lock. Okay, so make it all capital letters. That helps myself or the moderators to see them. And then that helps to make sure that I actually get to the questions. Okay, um, let me go ahead and get to a couple things. So the last two videos that I released, I released two videos this last week. And um, they were, let's see, we had uh, Kitchen AC. They were actually both AC videos. We had the Kitchen AC was too hot. Um, that was one, it was a Linux package unit. Uh, the customer called me out there and I had to do a temporary fix because the thermostat was bad and I didn't have a thermostat. Uh, and I didn't want to open up a supply house. I really didn't want to be there any longer than I had to because it was a late, I think it was an overtime service call if I remember right, yeah. So I got them up and operational by taking the thermostat faceplate off of another thermostat, okay? Because we're in the midst of this virus, we had a, a restaurant that's not allowed to have customers in the dining room, and um, the kitchen AC was down, had a bad thermostat, I stole the dining room thermostat. It was literally just taking it off the wall, putting it on, making sure that the program was right. And it got me through the weekend until I can go back out there and replace the thermostat, of which I did in the video, and then uh, also made some major recommendations about preventative maintenance work to the customer, of which they declined right now. Um, you know, I'm bummed out that the customers are declining the preventative maintenance work, but I understand it because everybody's just trying to survive right now. I'm just thankful that they call me to do any sort of a repair, right? So that way I have something coming in. Um, I know that I'm gonna get the work. It's just, you know, it's gonna come at a later time. You know, they're gonna have to do the maintenance work. I showed a blower assembly that was about to shake off the roof you know, because the blower assembly was all out of balance. Like we're going to get to fix that stuff. It's just going to take time for the dining rooms to open back up and then they're going to want it fixed. And like I said, it is kind of a bummer, but you know, I get it. I understand. Everybody's just trying to survive as far as the restaurants and stuff. So they got to do what they got to do. Um, the next video that I released was another Linux package unit and I actually released it this morning. Um, this one was last week. It was for a couple days last week. Actually, it was last Saturday. And uh, and then I had to go back out there Monday and then Tuesday. But that was an interesting one because I was called to a location that I do not normally service. 
because they were having a problem with their existing service company. So they had me go out there and uh, they had me, um, sorry, I got distracted by the chat for a second, but they had me go out there and diagnose the unit found that it was an electrical short. And then you guys saw in the video, like I went through the whole process and it was really a head scratcher because it was an intermittent electrical short that happened, but then it didn't happen. You know, went through the troubleshooting procedure, got it operational. Again, another restaurant that needed a lot of preventative maintenance that they declined right now. We will get it, but it's just going to take some time. Um, I'm actually having that particular customer is calling me out to more and more of their locations that I don't normally service, which is kind of out of my comfort zone because as the freeways open back up or, you know, as business starts moving again, you know, traffic is just going to jam up the freeways again. Right now, that location that I released in the video today is about an hour and 10 minutes away from my house without traffic. But you add traffic to the situation, it'll take me about two and a half hours to get there. Two to two and a half hours, depending on what time of the day you go. So I don't like to service that location just simply because of the traffic situation. Um, you know, I don't know, we may consider servicing that on a more permanent basis, but I'm going to have to make some agreements with them where they're maybe going to pay me for travel time home or something like that, because it sucks to be working out in Los Angeles area and sit in two hours of traffic to get home every night. That's, that's not what I want to do and not getting paid for it. You know, nah, not really my thing. So, um, Ernesto HVACR vlogger, you had asked me a question about when I'm going to have my shirts and stuff. So I'm supposed to get. I, I placed a big order, what I consider to be a big order. It's probably not big in the grand scheme of things, but like 200 something shirts and like 50 something hats or something like that, that I ordered. When I say big, it cost me a crap ton of money to pay up front, but I placed that order and I should be getting it late this week. I think, I think towards the end of the week, maybe like Thursday or Friday. Um, and then I got to figure out all the fun stuff of it. Okay. I, I'm, it is such a pain in the butt to do things the way that I'm doing them. And it's because I'm so picky about the, the quality of stuff that I do. And um, I, like, I, I just like to control everything. I'm a freak when it comes to everything. I'm a control freak. So I, uh, I ordered it. It'll be here. I got to set up some sort of a distribution, whether it will be a website or something like that. I've already got the business license and the seller's permit and all that stuff figured out. But I just need to uh, figure out the... So, you know, the, the, the way that I'm going to distribute the products, um, I kind of already have a couple ideas of websites that I'm going to use, but I need to design a website or come up with a method of doing that. And that's the hard thing for me because I'm so particular in the way that I do things. Like I don't want just a generic, you know, page with just like real simple. I, it's kind of hard. I have this in this vision in my head and I always want things to be this perfect way. And it holds me back in a lot of different ways, but Hopefully, so the short answer to the, the, the question that you asked me, Ernesto, is hopefully in the next two weeks, I should have a website set up and stuff uh, with the ability to go ahead and um, uh, start selling the merch, distribute it. So like I said, and I will order more. They, they had a quick turnaround time when I ordered it and they printed everything and stuff. So I'll be able to get more and more if, if I see the product moving quickly, then of course I'll order more. Um, I just like to do that way because then I control the product and I have it in my hands and I get to make sure that something that gets sent out to someone looks good and isn't misprint or anything like that. So, all right, <laughs> right on, uh, Indy ice, man. Thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh man. Clean balls. Did, was it, was it a freaking nut cream commercial or something like that that you had to watch? <laughs> That's funny, dude. Oh man, Molly Penderson, liquid entropy and liquid enthalpy. Um, that question hurts my head. I, I would have to look that up to properly answer that question. That's, that's too much information. And I'm sure you can just type that in the Google search bar and Google will answer that for you. So, um, all right, uh, let's see what I already answered that one. All right. Uh, can I ever show you the York predator unit test mode in one of my videos? Oh, helpful and cool videos. Yeah. So I remember you had asked me a while ago about the York test mode and I thought, I think they do, but I don't know for a hundred percent if they have a test mode. I'm, I think they have some sort of a test mode in the York predators, but, um, you know, I don't work on the York predator units very much. So, you know, if I ever get an opportunity, sure, I'll look into it. Um, I think they have it on the newer ones. Uh, they have a new circuit board and I think they have it on those, but I don't have any of the units with the super new circuit board. 
But um, yeah, you know, if I ever get the opportunity, you gotta get, guys gotta remember that I don't really plan my videos. My videos are based off a of service call. So when I go out to a service call and I have an opportunity to film something, I do. Um, so it's not like I go out and say, oh, I want to film a walk-in freezer call and I go find a walk-in freezer. It doesn't work that way. I just happen to get a lot of walk-in freezer, walk-in cooler and air conditioning calls, you know, refrigerators, all that stuff. So I tend to do the walk-in freezer, walk-in coolers and the AC calls more than I do the small refrigerators because I tend to send the employees to the refrigerator, like the little refrigerator calls and stuff. So, you know, it just, just works out that way. Um, let me see what else I got going on in here. Let me see. There's a test button. Yeah, yeah. I know there's a test button. It's just I haven't. I don't know if I've gone through the the test function of it. So, um, all right. So I'm gonna get to my list of things to talk about right here. Okay. So I did talk. Uh, you know, as far as the update about the virus and stuff is, is, you know, we are slowly getting back to work. Work is picking up. All my employees have come back to work. We've got them all back now. Um, we have uh, um, traffic is starting to pick back up. And uh, most restaurants, like I said a few minutes ago, are going to be opening back up soon. So slowly getting back to normal. I think we're going to have a, a, a real hit for the restaurants, though, because when they do open up, they can only open up to so much of a dining room. So that's going to be interesting. Um, whether or not it's going to be enough to keep them up and running, that's going to be the difficult thing for the restaurants. So um, let me see. Leonard Beers. I don't know that I've covered a picture that you sent me, Leonard. I don't think I got a picture. I don't know if I did or not. So, um, let me see what else here. Uh, R290 question about using the pinch off tool with refrigerant in it. What was my opinion on it? Adam Neal. I use the, the yellow jacket vice grip style pinch off tool, um, with refrigerant on the other side of it or R290. That's really the only thing that I use. Um, it's a little bit sketchy at first when you first do it because you are pinching off with a flammable refrigerant on one side and you're using an open flame on the other side to braise a line shut but I've never had a problem with it. You just be safe and be smart about it. Um, but that's what I've always used is that pinch off tool. I love it. So I shouldn't say I love it, but I mean, I, I tolerate it. So, um, let me see what else we got going on here. Uh, helpful and cool videos. No, I did not know that you're 11 years old. That's very interesting. Um, cool. All right. Can I use a DVD to run a single stage system like a variable? If so, how, I don't know what you mean by a DVD. Sorry, bud. Oh, VFD. Can you use a VFD to run a single stage system like a variable? If so, how? No, only if the system was designed for it. Uh, the compressor has to be uh, capable of being ran by a VFD. Um, and, you know, most of the time you have variable speed compressors that uh, are set up for that. So that way they can slow down and speed up. Uh, you have to remember that if you just slow down any compressor, potentially you can cause overheat issues. You still have to have enough suction gas coming back to cool the windings of the compressor. There's all sorts of things you have to consider when you use a variable speed uh, drive, basically. Um, okay, cool. Right on. Um, yeah, exactly. Ernesto. Ernesto lives up in Northern California, guys, in the Bay Area. He ha He's HVACR vlogger. Um, yeah, I know the traffic he sits in. I don't sit in none of that stuff, dude. I, I couldn't tolerate three and a half hours as a normal thing. There's no way. Uh, your boy Daniel, hack work and commercial. There's all kinds of hack work and commercial. I've done plenty of hack work myself. So, all right. Um, let me get to my list here. So Evan had asked me about advice on how to start applying at shops, okay? Um, if I remember, okay, yeah, so Evan is a new guy uh, going to school, getting ready. I think he said he was getting ready to graduate, and he wanted to know for advice on applying to shops. And then he also kind of had some questions about why employers ask for so much experience, okay? In general right now, our trade is hurting very much for employees. We, we struggle for employees right now, especially experienced employees. In fact, I announced on my video today that I'm looking for an experienced mechanic to come work in my, you know, in my service area. It's a struggle because as a business owner, we have a lot of things. Now I have no problem training people. I've trained many people over the years. Um, there's good things and bad things about training people. Um, but training people is expensive. It's difficult and it requires a lot of your attention. Okay. For instance, the way that I roll 
If I have a trainee working with me, for the most part, he's gonna be working with me every single day, okay? So what does that mean? That means that I have to be available to work every single day to keep him busy so that way he can work. The reason why I do that is because I wanna be responsible for training of my service technicians, okay? That way they can see the way that I wanna do things, um, you know? And occasionally I'll put him with one of our other service mechanics, but for the most part, I like to do the training. Um, so it's a struggle sometimes. Also. Uh, you know, training a service technician for me is not a profitable thing. You know, it's a gamble that you make in hopes that they stay so that way in the future they become a better service technician and start to generate revenue for you. Again, for me, the way that I do things, you know, I bring a, a, a trainee on basically as an apprentice and he rides with me. And essentially, I really don't make much money off of him while he's riding with me, okay? I usually uh, occasionally will charge for his time. And usually it just breaks even because you also have to remember as an employer, I have to worry about employment taxes, you know, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and it gets expensive over time. Okay. Uh, the gamble of, you know, hiring someone and training them again, there's a gamble with it. I said, is that you're going to put all this time and effort into this person. And then they potentially will leave when they're done being trained and take that knowledge that you gave them and move on somewhere else. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about that. I've had that happen many times. In fact, I can think of a service technician that, uh, um, that worked for me for a year straight you know, and I trained him, trained him, trained him. And then, you know, he decided to go work somewhere else. And it's like, wow, I didn't even get the opportunity to make any money off of that technician. It's, it's that struggle that you have to do. Okay. Um, in no way am I the perfect business and no way am I doing that. I'm sure there's lots of incorrect ways about the, or incorrect things about the way that I do things, but that's just how I roll. Okay. So to get back to your question, why, are companies looking for experience techs or why do they want all this experience is because we are desperate right now and we need service technicians that can hit the ground running. Right now, I'm being bombarded with work to say, you know, I mean, in a, in a way, the COVID thing happened, but before the COVID thing, you know, I was being bombarded with work and, you know, the potential is there. I need the help, but it's hard because you, you bring on a new service tech and you have to spend all your time doing that. And it gets kind of difficult. Another thing for me, a difficult thing is, is when I have an apprentice riding with me, I still get the super difficult calls and I still take the super difficult calls. So oftentimes the apprentice is going to get a lot of overtime. He's going to be working late nights and things like that. So that becomes even more expensive for me. So of course, as a business owner, I want to find that diamond in the rough service technician that already has experience that can hit the ground running, you know, and then I realize that I'm going to have to train him a little bit on, you know, the ways that we do things and procedural and stuff like that. But as far as your question goes, why do employers want experience? It's just, you know, it's, it's cost effective for us to hire someone that can hit the ground running and start generating revenue versus the amount of revenue we lose by training a technician. But I have trained some really good service technicians, um, you know, and uh, eventually everybody moves on. There's nothing you can do to control that. You know, you can do your best to try to keep them. But um, so tips about how to start applying at shops. OK, so depending on the legalities of your area, I always recommend this. Unfortunately, we can't really do this in California anymore, but I would highly suggest is reach if it's if they can do this and it's legit you know, as an apprentice, reach out to a shop and say, Hey, can I come work with you for a couple days for free, ride with them, interview them just as much as they're interviewing you, show them your work ethic and, you know, start your, your, your potential application that way. Okay. If someone is having a hard time saying, I just need someone with experience or if they're on the fence about hiring him, see if it's possible to offer your time for a day or two or longer to ride along and show your skills to them. Okay. That that's, that's one way to do it. Um, like I said, though, I can't really do that in California anymore because the laws are so strict. It's a nightmare. We have to bring people on. It's just a liability. Um, hopefully I answered your question. I know I kind of went off on a little bit of a rant as usual, but yeah, hopefully I get it. All right, let's see. Um, what am I missing in the chat here? Um, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, ha, that's funny. Yeah. Streamlab promoted the HVAC overtime show. If you guys could please go subscribe to the HVAC overtime channel. Okay. The reason why I say this is 
because they are threatening to kick me off of their show. Okay. I was invited to become a, a guest host, you know, and they kind of told me, you know, they kind of teased me with this semi permanent thing. And then now they're threatening to kick me off unless subscribers go to their channel. So please go subscribe to the HVAC overtime channel so I can stay. Um, I really need that gig. Uh, you know, I'm just messing with you guys, but I am going to be on the HVAC overtime show, you know, whenever I can work permitting. So go check out that channel guys. Uh, it's, it's a cool channel and it's a really cool hangout, uh, with myself and the other guys. And we, you know, have a lot of fun just talking and stuff this last week. I was super busy at work. So I ended up kind of calling in while I was on work you know, and doing that, but it's, it's a fun show. So check it out. Okay. All right. Let's see what else. Um, Adam Neal, thank you so very much for that super chat. That is awesome, but okay. Um, yeah, I was still busy. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> right on. All right. Uh, let's see. Chester Wolf. Thank you very much for that super chat. Have I ever worked on liquid pneumonia, heavy industrial? No, I have not. Um, I have not. A, it's very interesting to me, but I've never worked on the heavy industrial or the ammonia refrigeration. So, um, let me see what else, uh, what am I missing in here? Um, all right, I'm going to get back to my list here. Uh, the next question I had was from Lucas and, uh, Lucas wanted to know, and, and I'm going to read the question kind of, you know, that, that he wrote. Okay. He said he wanted to know where I got my skills from and how he could get them. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit there. Okay. And then he asked me if he should join an apprenticeship. He's from Canada. Okay, Lucas, first off, and he, he had mentioned in his email that, you know, he was somewhat of a mechanically inclined person. Uh, I can't tell you where I got my skills from. Okay. Uh, my skills, I do not think my, of myself as an amazing service technician. I'm just another guy that happens to, I think just how, I think that the, the only thing that separates me from every other service technician or that makes me unique is that I'm inquisitive and I, and I learn really quickly from my mistakes maybe. Okay. But majority of the information that I give and I share and the warnings and the tips is because I've made those mistakes, okay? I am human. I am not perfect, all right? I have screwed up a lot of stuff. Uh, luckily, I got away with it on a lot of it, okay? But some of it, I had to pay the price because I ended up having to pay customers. There was one time in my the very early part of my career that I left a walk-in cooler off when I left a job and uh, it stayed off. The, the customer did not realize I left it off for like 15 hours. Okay. Or supposedly they didn't realize it. And, uh, I ended up having to split the cost of all the product in that walk-in cooler with the customer. I think that cost our company at the time. I was just a service technician. I think it cost us three grand. Um, and we split it with them. So I think they had to throw away $6,000 in product. Uh, that was a, that was a learning thing right now. There's a lot to that story. You know, really, they didn't notice for 15 hours that I had left it off. Like, how is that really my fault? You know, that's a restaurant, they go in and out of the box, the cooks were in and out of it. So that's why we split the cost because they tried to come at us with that, that was $6,000 in product. And I said, you know, and then we kind of negotiated back and forth and told them, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. You guys have some fault here too. Yes, I left it off, but oh my gosh, you know, but anyways, you know, so I learned from my mistakes and I've certainly made a ton of them. Okay. Um, we own up to our mistakes and we try to be as honest as possible, but there's nothing super special about me other than I, you know, I, I feel like I just kind of learn from that stuff. So how can I teach someone my stuff? Like, how can you get the skills that I have? Um, I try to share as much of, of that as I can in my videos. I try to show the information, um, as far as the apprenticeship you know what, you need to do what's best for you and your family. I certainly don't know the the, the work environment in Canada. Um, I'm pretty sure it's somewhat of a union strong, heavy place. Uh, certainly, we've got some friends in here. HVACR North, Joe is from Canada, and uh, a couple other people are from Canada. Um, you know, they could probably answer your question a little bit better, but union, non-union, either way, you need to do what's best for your family, but you need to weigh out the benefits. Okay. I live in California. The union is not strong, but I'm not saying it's not a good place to go, but you just have to consider that it depends on what you want to work on, what kind of training you have to go through. Traditionally union jobs offer some of the best education out there. Now that's not the case for everywhere, but if you can get educated with a union company and be profitable and make good money doing so, I strongly suggest you do so. Okay. If it works 
good for you and your family. All right. So um, feel free if I didn't answer your question enough to, you know, email me some more or feel free to ask some of the guys in the chat if you're in here right now that happen to live in Canada. They can kind of talk to you a little bit more about what's the best bet depending on the area you live in and stuff. Okay. All right. Let me see what else I'm missing in this chat right here. Um, yep. Making mistakes is how you learn to be a better service technician. And that is true, you know, and I do say something oftentimes in my videos that I try to share the mistakes that I've made so that you won't make them at the same time. I realize that you won't necessarily learn everything just from the mistakes that I've made. You're going to have to make your own mistakes too. But if you can have a little bit of knowledge, maybe the mistakes won't be as bad. Maybe you can remember, oh, I remember seeing that in Chris's video. This happened, you know, that kind of stuff. I would highly suggest you, uh, you know, at least just try to think about things. You know, when I was in school, the way that it worked for me was I was taught by my father. I was taught by, um, you know, my senior technician that I worked under uh, by both of them. And I went to school at the same time. Each one of them would give me a different way on how to do the same task. Okay. Or how to fix the same thing. Like a motor starter. I'd get a description from my dad. I'd get a description from my mentor. And then I'd get a description from school. And all three of those kind of sat in my brain until one day I was in school and they were talking about motor starters, magnetic motor starters or motor safety controls for exhaust fans. And uh, one day I was sitting in school and it was really confusing. We were going over schematics and then it all clicked. Each one of the three methods that I had been told about how they work, it kind of all made sense in my head and it just like snap. And then now they totally make sense to me. And it's like, oh, they're not that intimidating after all. It's really just a set of contacts and a holding circuit and an overload. Okay, no big deal, right? But it took three different methods of teaching me. So maybe I could be one of those methods for you guys. Maybe you're not going to understand everything that I say in my videos, but maybe, you know, I could just be that one little bit of information that you're missing or help to, you know, share, you know, give you something, you know, and maybe it'll click in your head too, if that makes sense to you. So, all right, let's see what else we got in here. Let me see. Uh, Bo Bo Bohan, Bojan, I don't know how you say your name. You said some, some techs don't learn from their mistakes. They keep making them and other techs fix them. That's very frustrating when people don't learn from their mistakes or they continue to do the same thing over and over again. Okay. There is no such thing as a super tech. And that is absolutely correct. Familia Sanchez says that. Absolutely correct. There's just service technicians. Okay. Um, there's guys that have a lot of knowledge and usually, if, if they tell you they've never made mistakes, they're lying to you because majority of the people's knowledge comes from mistakes that they've made or lessons that they've learned. So, uh, would I ever consider a tech with his own truck and pay him accordingly? Mr. Ice. Yeah, no, we can't do that here because of liability in California. There's too much liability. Um, and our insurance companies would eat us alive. Uh, for instance, the reason why is I have to have liability insurance on my vehicles, right? And you know, we have very, very, very high coverage amounts of liability insurance. And if a service technician, uh, you know, says they're going to have their own insurance, you know, we would have to be named on their insurance, it would have to go through so many hoops that it wouldn't be beneficial for the service tech. Um, they wouldn't be able to afford the insurance insurance that we have to carry to keep them in the vehicles. And uh, then the other thing is, is like maintenance and things like that. Let's say that they're not maintaining their vehicle. See, insurance isn't it's it just it just leads into a legal nightmare. California is a nightmare to do that kind of stuff with. Uh, many, many years ago, we had a service technician that did that, but there's no way we could do it now due to liability. Um, Let's see, Marcus M. Have I gotten your emails? Uh, it's possible, Marcus. I think I did. I think you emailed me earlier, but I, I don't really remember right now. Uh, you, that you know, that's a great point. So, guys, um, I get hundreds of emails, and I try to answer them uh, as much as I can. Sometimes some of the emails are more detailed, so they take a lot of time to answer. And uh, it can be kind of difficult. It's not that I'm ignoring you guys. It's just that I get an insane amount of emails. So I'm trying. I try my best. But that's one thing that I have to be able to let go of um, to keep my sanity as a creator is I can't be too attached to this. Of course, I don't want to distance myself and I don't want to not be attentive to my followers and viewers and people asking me questions and stuff. It's just 
Ooh. man, sometimes it is difficult. Um, and I have to be honest with everybody this last week, like it, you know, I didn't want to make a video last night. I, I was, you know, I, I edited it and I was getting ready to upload it last night and then I decided to do it this morning, but like, I didn't want to, I was just burnt out. Plus I had a really good weekend and I just wanted to keep that flow going of just chilling out with my family and friends and, you know, having a nice chill weekend, but I did, I uploaded it and I actually feel good when I do upload because I do like to read the emails and stuff, but I just don't necessarily get to answer them all. So. Um, what's the difference between evaporator superheat and compressor superheat? Well, evaporator superheat and compressor superheat are the same thing. You're just measuring it at a different place. Okay. So, um, now typically if your evaporator superheat is 10 degrees, then your compressor superheat is definitely going to be a lot higher as the suction line absorbs more heat on the way to the compressor. Okay. Uh, there is usually a number that Copeland recommends. They want you to have some sort of superheat coming back to the compressor, they don't want you to have zero superheat because zero superheat, you'd be flooding back your compressor with liquid refrigerant and that would be no good. Uh, but there is no difference other than the place that you measure it. So you take the uh, suction saturation temperature um, of you know the refrigerant essentially, okay, depending on the blend, it gets a little bit more confusing, but you essentially take the saturation temperature of the refrigerant and you compare it to the suction line temperature, okay? And you're gonna calculate your superheat. You do the same thing at the evaporator, you do the same thing at the compressor, it's just that your compressor number is gonna be a higher number, the evaporator is gonna be a lower number. Essentially though, you know, in a system, we want our superheat as low as possible to get the most efficiency out of our evaporator, but we can't have a certain you know, you need to have so much superheat coming back to the compressor to make sure that we protect the compressor from flood back or, you know, we don't want to overload the compressor. So oftentimes people, you know, on the low temp stuff that we run lower superheat, they'll add, you know, suction line accumulators and things like that, heat exchangers to try to make sure that we don't have too low a superheat coming back. But again, to be the, you know, they're pretty much the same. Um, Chris, thank you so very much for that super chat. I really, really appreciate it. Okay. Again, I, I, am going to keep addressing this. I do appreciate those. That's awesome. Um, but it is not expected and you guys do not need to do that, but thank you very much, Chris. Okay. Uh, I, you saw a video that had keg taps and I talked about how the fluid was not my problem with distributors. What point would I cross that line for the customer? Okay, I'm trying to understand your question. So you, you, you saw a video that had keg taps and I talked about how the fluid was not my problem with distributors. What point would you cross? I don't know if I quite understand your question, Chris, because I think I need context. So in general, I'm gonna just kind of talk vaguely and hopefully I answer your question, okay? You can try to rephrase it if you want to. So um, I work on glycol systems, okay? Where we take a glycol mixture and we cool the beer lines. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, bud. And uh, I work on those units, but it's a great area because the beverage distributors, they handle the glycol system repairs, okay? So glycol in a system, if they have dirty glycol, I don't change the glycol, okay? Um, I can add it just to get them by, but the beverage company, the beer company, they typically service the glycol system and then they'll call us for the refrigeration repairs. It's just that weird thing. I don't, I don't set regulators on glycol systems uh, as far as beer systems and things like that. That's why the beverage company, because they know what the gas pressures need to be for pushing the beer through the system. They know what to set the nitrogen at or the CO2 or whatever you know, uh, compressed gas they're using to push the beer through the lines. Um, so they usually handle the, the, the glycol and the glycol lines. And I really just work on the power pack unit or the glycol unit in the attic. So I'm hoping I answered your question for you. And that's pretty typical out here in Southern California is you're gonna have a beverage company that handles you know, the, the, the beer and the, the, the fluid, the glycol that's flowing through the lines, they'll change it. They'll change the lines if there's leaks. But if there's a refrigeration repair, they usually push that onto me. They'll actually sell them and install new glycol units or power pack units, but then they just call me to service them. Hopefully that answers for you, bud. All right, let's see. Um, what else am I missing in here? What is approach temperature? So I must have gotten four or five emails and comments about approach. And I do have that on my list to talk about right now, okay? So, um, where's my list right here? I have a, oh, okay, right here. So approach temperature, I use it quite often because Linux, 
manufacturing or Linux package units and residential units, they use approach temperature as a charging metric, okay? They often want you to weigh the factory charge in, but then if you're verifying charge, they want you to look at the approach temperature on the systems with the TXV, okay? Now, approach is nothing new. People are like, what is this voodoo magic? Approach has been around forever, guys, and it's actually used in several mechanical trades across the board. All right. So the if you look at the actual dictionary definition of approach is approach temperature is literally the difference between two fluid streams. That's that's the answer. OK, so in our case, if I wanted to measure the approach temperature on a Linux package unit, what I would be measuring is the difference between the outdoor air coming into the condenser and the liquid line surface temperature. So we're not putting our gauges on the system to measure approach. We are literally taking a temperature clamp, measuring the liquid line temperature coming out of the condenser, and we are measuring the outdoor air before it passes through the condenser, okay? So I always tell people it's an ass backwards subcooling method, okay? It's a non-invasive condenser performance method of measuring it, okay? So approach, the really cool thing about approach is that if you've started up a system and you've commissioned a system, and you can actually use approach on other equipment too, but if you've started up a system and commissioned a system and measured the approach temperature with a clean condenser and with a proper refrigerant charge, you can then take that approach temperature from that point forward and compare the system to that same approach temperature if you ever go back. It's a non-invasive way of measuring the performance of the condenser, okay? So that's what the approach is. So again, liquid line temperature coming out of the condenser, okay? You have to be careful though, if it's a multiple stage system, you have to, especially on the Linux units, I think I said this in my last video, that 15 ton Linux unit that I worked on has three stages, okay? So it has three sections of condenser that you have to be concerned with. If you're gonna measure the outdoor air temperature, you have to measure the outdoor air temperature in front of the condenser section that you're working with. So the first stage, second stage, and third stage on my unit, we had potentially two to three different places we could measure the outdoor air temperature, and it does matter, okay? Um, Linux typically wants you to have a certain approach temperature. If your approach temperature is way too low, then theoretically you can be overcharged. If your approach temperature is way too high, theoretically you could be undercharged. Okay, but approach can also be affected by dirty condenser and different things like that. So you have to make sure that you have a good baseline, measure your approach, and follow it from there. One thing I will say is that oftentimes on the Linux equipment, they will have uh, on the package units, they will have an approach temperature that they want you to follow. But if you've never measured that approach temperature, you know, there may be a crappy installation. You know, you may have a consistently dirty condenser. You need to make sure all your equipment is operating properly before you dive into the approach, okay? And also Linux will tell you that approach temperature is not good if you have a gross undercharge. So uh, Linux actually gives you some baseline pressures that they expect your system to be operating at, at an, a certain ambient temperature. And then if within those ranges, you then set your approach and add charge or remove charge based on that approach. So again, it's kind of like an ass backwards way of subcooling. Um, hopefully I answered that question for you. Let me see what else. Have I ever done residential HVAC? No. Um, I mean, other than for family members and friends, no. Uh, I do not do residential on a regular. Um, it's not really something that I'm too interested in doing. Of course, I would do it to survive if I had to, but it's not really something that I'm super interested in doing. Uh, you know, I like the commercial side of things. I like dealing with facilities managers and stuff like that. It's just easier. Um, let me see. Eight years ago, you noticed that your AC's vent started to fill with water when it rains. What could cause this? You were thinking humidity problems. Uh, dogs green, it really depends on where you're at. So yes, if you have a really high relative humidity in your, your, your space, you know, you can, you can have moisture problems. Um, if you have, uh, you know, roof leaks or anything like that, it can cause moisture problems. Uh, it really depends. Okay. If your system is oversized, it can cause major moisture problems. You know, air conditioning really needs to operate within a certain window, especially depending on your environment. There is no one size fits all. Um, if you have a contractor that tells you that you have a, a 2,400 square foot house and that needs a four ton unit, they're, they don't, they're not giving you correct information. They're, they're, they're making a guess. It may be an educated guess, but they're making a guess because every single installation is different in one way or another, depending on the insulation in your house, your ambient conditions, the humidity levels, who knows, okay? For all they know, you know, you could be 
have a pot farm in your house, you know, and you need to maintain humidity levels, you know, or something. I mean, there's so many different variables that can go into this. So every installation is different and uh, we need not take a cookie cutter approach to installing and designing systems. We need to treat each one individually. Now, I realize that probably 99% of the companies out there do not do proper load calculations and different things like that. Nothing against those companies because even myself, I have customers that want me to replace their air conditioning equipment on the roof, a package unit, and they don't want to pay for a load calculation. They just want me to put back what was there. Okay. So I make sure I tell them and I educate them. Look, I'll put back what's there. Whether or not that's correct, I don't know. You know, I give them the information up front. If they want to go with that cookie cutter approach, that's fine, but I need to do my due diligence and make sure that they know that. So what can cause your water issues in your house? It's hard to say. You need a proper analysis of your system. Someone needs to come in and measure the delivered capacity, measure the, uh, the, the, the humidity removal, the moisture removal from the air. They need to measure a lot of different things, okay? Um, there could be a whole bunch of different stuff going on that can cause a lot of moisture buildup in your house. Moisture is not good, by the way, too, because that can lead to mold and bacteria and all kinds of different issues. So you want to get that stuff taken care of. That can cause a lot of health issues, too. Um, let me see. Uh, I see a lot of questions going by. Forgive me if I'm missing them. Repost them, guys, okay? Do scroll compressors have higher compression ratios than reciprocating compressors? Um whether or not they have an exact higher compression ratio, I do not know the answer to that one. I'm trying to think here right now. Um, I wouldn't say that they have higher compression ratios. Well, no, I guess they might, depending on the size or something. Um, I, I kind of need some context to your question there, Christian. Um, let me see. Can I use 134A as a replacement for R12-22 cap tube systems without changing the oil? You're not supposed to. Um, R134A is meant to be working with polyester oil. And typically, well, R12 is with mineral oil. And R22 in the early stages was mineral oil. And then towards the end, it went with polyester oil. So no, it's not just a swap the refrigerant out. You're probably going to need to do an oil change. Now, will it work? Maybe for a while. Um, would I do it? No, because it's not worth the liability or the risk for me. Um, let me see what else we got going on in here. Okay, I got a question on here, and let me mark this one off. Leonard had asked me, Leonard had sent me a picture. Forgive me if you had asked this in here, Leonard. I know a few people were asking me if I got their emails. Um, and I, I'm i bad with remembering stuff. That's why I have to have it written down on a sheet in front of me. So Leonard had asked me, he sent me a picture, and he said, hey, what is this valve, and why is it being used? And the valve that he sent me a picture on was actually a valve that I just talked about last week. And it is a discharge temperature controlled expansion valve. It was a DTC valve. Okay. This right here, all it is, is an expansion valve guys. Okay. I've talked about expansion valves many times on my channel. Okay. This is a standard thermostatically controlled expansion valve that I did a cutaway on. Okay. You have a thermostatically controlled, uh, you have a sensing bulb opens and closes the valve. All right. This one right here, it's pretty much the same thing. The sensing bulb is a little bit different. The sensing bulb is just this. This well is pushed into a spot in the head of the compressor. And all that it does is help to cool off the, uh, the, the head of the compressor, basically. This is meant to go on a scroll compressor. This is a, uh, a Copeland product. It's called a DTC valve, okay? Um, it's a rendition of a uh, temperature responsive expansion valve that Copeland, or I mean that Sporland has, um, but this right here was custom designed for Copeland. It's meant to go on a rotolock connection on the compressor. And all that it does is under really high compression ratio situations on low temp compressors, this right here helps to cool the head of the compressor because that can be a problem. So your question that you had asked me was, you know, is this a sensing bulb? Yes, it is. This drives the valve open whenever the head of the compressor gets, I think it's above 220 degrees, I think, or it's 225 or 250 or something like that. But you got to understand that's the internal temperature of the compressor. That's what opens it. It's there to maintain, you know, 200 to 220 or lower discharge temperature measured on the discharge line. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question for you, Andy or Leonard. Um, let me see what else I have on my list here. 
Uh, let me look at the chat real quick. Uh, the 98 DeVille. Have I ever gone behind another company and it was such a mess that I had to walk away? No, I don't say I can't say that it was a mess that I had to walk away. I certainly have gone behind other companies um, and I'm sure other companies have probably I'm not going to be vain and say that I'm not my, my shit doesn't stink. I'm sure someone's come behind me and talk crap, too. So who knows? Um, but I can't think of an instance where I just walked away from a job. Uh, I. I would always give the customer an option. So, you know, if I walk in and it's a nightmare, well then heck yeah, I'm going to bid that so high that they're not going to use me. I've done that. But if I did get the job, I was going to make out like a bandit because I wasn't going to go through all the headache of dealing with the nightmare that that previous company had to do or the customer or whatever. So have I ever really walked away from a job per se? Like, no, I'm not going to do this. No, I don't think so. I, I would just maybe just approach the job and say, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make out like a bandit. So here's my quote, you know, that kind of thing. That's how I would approach that situation. And I, and there'd be a lot of disclaimers in there. More than likely all the equipment's going to be replaced and, you know, certain situations have to be met by the customer involving electricians and plumbers and different things like that. Um, let me see what I'm missing in here. Um, oh yeah. So the movie quotes are already coming in there. I don't know if anybody gets the movie or the song quotes yet, but they'll be coming in soon. What do I mean when I say different stages working on a unit? So six, a ret, I think that's how you say your name. So depending on the type of equipment, so I have, um, they'll, they'll separate the equipment into stages, meaning that I have three different compressors. And the reason why we do this is because the heat load on the building requires so many BTUs at a certain ambient. But as the indoor temperature of the building drops, we don't necessarily need that equipment to perform as much as if it was really hot in the building, okay? So the, the, let's just say the building requires 15 tons of air conditioning, okay? 15 tons is a metric, it's a measurement of how many BTUs our system requires, uh, our, our equipment is required to remove the heat load of the building. Hopefully that makes sense. I think I butchered that a little bit. But um, so instead of having a 15 ton compressor that when it turns on, it cools down the building instantaneously, we stage that equipment and we have three different compressors that are five tons each, okay? The theory behind that is that we can have better building comfort and better humidity control. Because if we bring the temperature of the building down way too fast, we're not necessarily gonna control the hum humidity, okay? But if we bring that temperature and maintain a nice even temperature throughout the day where the temp comes up just a little bit and goes down, up, down, up, down like that, then we can have better comfort in the building. So we'll stage the equipment and we have three five ton compressors in one unit versus one big compressor. And we call that staging. Okay. So I would say first stage, second stage, third stage, theoretically, this isn't always the case, but theoretically the stages are going to sequence. First stage is going to come first, second stage, second, third stage, third, but that's not always the case because sometimes we might have um, you know, something in there that stages the compressors differently to, to give them even runtime. Okay. Uh, so hopefully I answered that one for you. Um, Matthew Russell, let me see where you said that, uh, Carol Baskin. Good to see you in here. Boxers or briefs, uh, briefs. All right. Um, my moderators are probably pissed off that I actually answered that question, but you know, I'll tolerate you today. All right. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Right on. Cool. Um, what beer am I drinking tonight? Uh, or are we drinking beer tonight or not? No, I'm not drinking beer tonight. I drank a little bit too much over the weekend. We had some friends over on Saturday for the first time in a long time. We actually had real people at our house, guys. Shh, don't tell anybody, okay? Um, yeah, we had real people at our house, like friends. And yeah, we had a good time Saturday night hanging out, barbecuing, had a bonfire, played cornhole. But the kids were all playing in the backyard. It was nice. It was nice to have people over again. So yeah, I, I'm drinking water right now. All right. Um, when I do favors to managers, it always bites me in the butt. So don't. That is very true. Yeah, I don't do favors. Um, let's see. Joe, you said don't commercial units kill the humidity removal, removal with one stage blower or does it stay constant because separate circuits in the coil? Okay. Great question, Joe. Okay. So I'm going to try to dissect that real quick. So don't commercial units kill the humidity removal with one stage blower or does it stay constant because separate circuits in the coil? Well, Joe, so what we've been doing more and more lately, 
So first off, let me preface this by saying, I live in Southern California. Joe, you live in Florida. I have no idea what humidity is, okay? If we hit 40%, if we hit 50% humidity, we lose our minds, okay? So I am not one to talk about humidity removal uh, as much as you would be a much better expert on that, Joe. Um, but humidity removal uh, as far as staging our equipment. So we also have a lot of energy mandates here in California. Uh, these are global or these are going around the country, but especially in California where we have multi-stage air volume units. Okay. Um, to save energy, we will stage our equipment. So we'll stage the first, the second and the third stage, but we'll also stage the indoor blower motor too. Okay. Because the theory behind a multi-stage unit, why do we see a VFD in one of my units guys? The reason why we see a VFD actually have a couple of them right here. Hold on. We got a VFD. This is off of a captive air exhaust fan, but it does the same thing. And this is a VFD off of a carrier package unit. Okay. The whole point of this VFD. Sorry, let me put these back. And I will get to your question, Joe. I'm going to just go off on a answer this and educate a little bit too. So the whole point of using a VFD for the indoor blower on my units is to save energy. Okay. The theory is, is that if you have three compressors running, my evaporator coil is going to be full of condensation, right? So what happens when we're full of condensation? When we're full of condensation on our evaporator coil, it's nice and cold. It's got water dripping off of it. It's going down the drain. The airflow gets restricted, okay? Therefore, if we want to deliver the true 6,000 CFMs of air needed for that unit, we have to have a certain horsepower blower motor to push the air through even with a wet coil so that way we get 6,000 CFMs of air delivered downstairs, okay? But what happens if we turn off the first or the second and the third stage? The unit satisfies on second stage cooling and we only need one stage. Well, we're still pushing 6,000 CFMs of air through that building and our humidity removal might get a little bit messed up, okay? Because now we're pushing way too much air or our humidity control, I should say, okay? So we actually stage the indoor blower motor on a multi-stage air volume unit. So that way, when we get a second stage call, it speeds up the blower motor. But when we get a first stage call, it slows down. And you know, the fancier the units you go into, they can stage them for multiple stages. So um, here we do that. Uh, but again, I, I say for humidity control, but more or less energy really, because we don't have humidity out here. So, you know, um, you know, if, if I'd imagine that if you're, you know, running just on first stage, you know, and still pushing the 6,000 CFMs of air through that 15 ton unit, um, you know, yeah, you'd probably move, remove humidity. I guess you would remove humidity pretty well if you were just calling for first stage. Well, no, not necessarily because you're not, you know, it depends. So I kind of answered your question, Joe, hopefully, and kind of educated some people a little bit, but again, I, I to preface that I don't, I don't know what humidity is here. So. All right, let's see what else. Uh, do I keep a dry set of clothes in my van for when it's wet out? Yes, uh, in the wet season for sure. But even in the summertime, I'll keep extra shirts depending on what I'm doing. In the summertime, my stuff will evaporate. The water will evaporate off my clothes so quickly that it doesn't matter. Uh, we had 120, 120, yeah, 120 degrees is an extreme high for us in the summertime. Do I ever set settings on the Linux Prodigy 2.0? Yes, I do. Every once in a while, I'll go through and, and change the parameters on a Linux Prodigy unit. Yes. Um, let me see what else we got. Um, what am I missing? I already answered that one. Does global warming make AC units work harder to reject heat? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to get political here, but I'm not a huge global warming fanatic over here. Okay. I'm not going to say that our climate doesn't get hotter, but I mean, of course, if we have a higher temperature outside, our equipment's going to run harder. So, I mean, you know, I guess it's going to have to work harder to reject the heat. Sure. Okay. Um, so without getting too political about that. All right. Um, let me go down to the bottom right here. Adam, dude, thank you so very much for that super chat again, bud. Uh, yeah. So Adam says, uh, in my last video, looking at all the wiring, he would be losing his mind basically. Uh, what would I say to someone who comes across a unit? So you, if you guys haven't watched my video, you open it up and you guys look and you know, previous company kind of destroyed the unit, taking parts out and stuff like that. It can be overwhelming walking up to a rat's nest of wiring and different things like that. The easiest way that I can say is that you have to understand the equipment that you're working on. Now, when you get into big commercial stuff and you start, you know, yes, 
there's occasions that I have to go to work on something that I've never worked on before. Okay. But when you're starting out for the most part, in my opinion, I'm not judging anybody for not doing this the way that I do it. Okay. But in my opinion, I'm not going to send an apprentice or a new service tech out to do really difficult stuff. Okay. Um, he needs to understand the sequence of operation. Now, once you get into the bigger commercial stuff, and again, I don't even know what really big is because I, the biggest stuff I work on is like 35 tons, but I have a concept of what's going on. So when I walk up to a rat's nest of wiring, it's not that difficult for me to unravel that. I just stop and break it down. Okay. Yes. There's a million different wires in that unit, but if you just focus on one component and say, okay, this relay this wire's going over here. Okay, so then you kind of get an idea and you start putting it together, okay? Kind of like um, the an analogy that I'll use is when you're doing a load calculation on your house, okay? A box load calculation is one of the easiest ways to understand a load calculation. You do it room by room, okay? You, you, you break it down room by room. You do a load on that room. You do a load on that room. You add it all together. Then you get a giant load calculation. When you're doing a repair on one of these units, I, pri I, I compartmentalize it like that, okay? I'm having an issue here. These are the components that can be affected. These wires go here. You know, and that's just my way of understanding something. So um, let me see what I'm missing in here. I'm reading Joe's comment right here. So, so the guess the way you're thinking is the section of the intercoil that's the first stage still has only a portion of the total CFM. So you guess the rest is like dilution air. Yeah, I would imagine so. I guess that makes sense, Joe. But also on the flip side, if you're if you're pushing through, I guess there's there's a there, there would have to be a lot of bypass air too, then though, right? Because if you've got a loaded coil, let's say you've got three stages and you have a loaded coil and you don't have that resistance across the coil, then you're going to theoretically push more air through the unloaded side, right? Um, but I guess that's probably why manufacturers actually don't for the most part, stage evaporator coils that way. Now that I think about it on the old carrier package units, I, I maybe nobody probably understands what I'm saying, but on the old carrier package units, the first stage was the bottom half of the evaporator. The second stage was the top half. Okay. But manufacturers have since kind of gone away from that. If I remember correctly, where they'll no, no, even Linux. No. Now that I think about it again, I'm sorry, guys, I'm going off on all kinds of tangents and thinking as I'm thinking, as I'm talking, as I'm thinking, but yeah, Linux to this day, they still have three sections of the evaporator coil. So bottom, middle, top, first, second, third. The first is usually the bottom. So my thing is, is that if you don't slow down that air and you're pushing through a lot of air, a lot of it's going to end up bypassing that lower section anyways. Huh, that's, a, yeah, mind explosion right now. Sorry, random crap going on in my head right now. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, can you charge a system by gauges by adding 30 PSI plus ambient? No. Okay, I world leader. So that is an old rule of thumb. And I will say that I was taught to charge equipment that way. But that is incorrect. Okay, you're making an educated or you're making a guess. I wouldn't even say an educated guess by adding 30 degrees to the condensing temp and then adding refrigerant till your condensing saturation pressure is 30 degrees above the ambient temp. Okay, no, you can't charge a system that way. Okay, there's a lot of variables that come into play. Now, am I saying that condensing temp over ambient is a bad metric to use when charging a system? No, but it's one of many metrics that you're gonna use to come to a conclusion in the end, okay? So um, when I'm charging a system, I'm gonna look at the overall performance. I'm gonna look at the airflow as best as I can. But again, I, I said this on my last stream, airflow is one of the hardest things to accurately measure, okay? But once you have your airflow set and it's going correctly, then you can do some rules of thumb to find out what your evaporator pressure should be, what your condensing pressure should be, okay? And those rule of thumb can get you in the ballpark, but ideally you need to lean on the manufacturer to find out what their required superheat and or subcooling should be, okay? And you're gonna take the required superheat and subcooling, you're gonna take condensing temp over ambient, evaporator temperature under you know space temperature or evaporator pressure under space temperature, whatever, you guys get what I'm saying. And you're going to take all those things and you're going to come to a conclusion. So can you charge a system by gauges by adding 30 PSIG to the ambient temperature? No, that is not the correct way to charge a system. Okay. It might get you in the ballpark, but no. All right. Um, do, oh, good question, Mr. Green. Um, 
Yeah, that that is a good. Uh, I'm going to point a great point, Joe. First stage has to be on the bottom, or condensation will re-evaporate on the dry coil. That is that is a really good point. And another thing too, uh, on the old, this used to be a carrier problem on their older package units that had a slanted slab coil. Um, when the first stage would fail, uh, the second stage would continue to run, and the condensation would run down the second stage, and then right where the first stage uh, evaporator started, it would drip straight off because it needed that, that path of, you know, fluid to make down to the drain pan. Basically, again, I'm going off on a thing where people don't understand, but yeah, that is a good point, Joe. Um, so do I, do I take into account people in the building into the load calculation? Yes, that is a very important thing to take into account. Now, most places, what they'll do is the design engineer, if they do a, a legit load calculation, the design engineer is going to look at the location where the building is at. They're going to look at what's going to be in the building. Is it going to be plants? Is it going to be people? Is it going to be machinery? Who knows? All of that is added into the load calculation, okay? And if you don't take that into account, you can run into all kinds of problems. Uh, JJ Services and HVACR, thank you so very much for that super chat, bud. That is awesome, okay? Thank you. Um, but yeah, you have to take all that stuff into account. Now, does every person take that into account? No, but when you're doing a load calculation in the simplest form on a residential house, um, say you're using like right soft software or something like that, they're going to take rooms. They're going to assume that there's going to be people in every room. You're going to take that into account because everything adds a load to the building. So, you know, if you're working in an industrial setting and they're driving tractor trailers into that building, they have to take that into account. If you're working in a florist and you've got a bunch of, you know, plants in there, you have to take that into account. Not only do you have to take that into account, but you have to look at what's going to be in the building to decide, um, you know, how the, uh, the equipment is sized and how it's going to perform because, you know, there's a comfort level for people. You don't want the humidity to be too low because then you dry skin out, you create static electricity, you have all sorts of issues. But if you want it, if you have the humidity too high, people are uncomfortable, they feel clammy, you know, all kinds of things. So the same thing goes for, um, you're going to have a really big right now is hydroponics. Um, you know, whether it be with pot or just general plants in general, people are growing plants inside using all kinds of different lights and different things like that. They're even growing vegetables and stuff inside now. So hydroponics is a really big one because you don't want to dry that out because if you dry the plant out, if it's pot, that's going to be a problem. I mean, you, you got to control humidity levels. So very important. Yes. You want to pay attention to the occupancy in the space and or what's in the space because that affects your load calculation too. Um, let me see. Am I born and raised in Southern California? No, I was born in Rolla, Missouri of all places. Um, but I was raised in California. I moved here when I was three. I still have family in Missouri, but yes, I've lived in Southern California. I've lived in Orange County, California, specifically Cyprus is where I grew up for elementary school. And then I moved out to the Inland Empire, uh, Riverside and have lived here ever since. Well, I did a brief stint in our high desert, but yeah, we don't mention that stint. All right. Um, yes, it is Pink Floyd learning to fly was my, the song. Yes, it was. Um, let me see. Do I take, oh, I already answered that question. Um, and sorry guys, I'm, there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat. So I'm like way all over the place. Uh, let me see. Yeah, the blow off issue sucks. I, yeah, that is right, Joe. All right. Um, let me see. What's that in the back on the wall? Uh, actually, I'm going to because uh, I get a lot of questions. Some of you have seen this already. I'm going to play a little teaser right now or a little video for you guys right now. And it's going to explain everything in here. Um, hold on just one second. Let me cue this up and we'll pull that up right there. And let me transition over to here and then I'll play this for you real quick and it'll explain everything. Um, let's go to display capture. Let's turn this volume up, this volume down, two seconds. Gonna come in and do a little studio tour with the behind the scenes of what goes on in here. So 
Um, a lot of people question the stuff that I have up on my shelves in here. Uh, these are both Hermetic compressor analyzers, this one being the oldest, an old Annie. And then this one is thermal engineering, I believe. Uh, this is the one that I actually used um, when I was first coming up. Uh, discharge bypass valve. Uh, Sporlin sent me that when I was cutting apart a bunch of valves. We got my dad's old Simpson 260. Uh, just a bunch of field piece um, meters back there. Some other various meters, fluke meters, different things. This is a scroll compressor that I cut apart. Here's the scroll plate, um, all the different components. I think I have a video maybe on Instagram on that. Um, there's the motor. Uh, just some other trinkets. Uh, my wife randomly put this in here as a joke to see if I would notice this gnome, and I just kind of left it in here. Um, these are some things. I uh, just released my first video on my tool review channel, HVACR Tools. Do me a favor and go subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I did on work pants, different types and the kind that I chose to use. Um, gonna be doing a review on the Sporlin Smart Pro R sensors. These are the long range ones. Uh, we'll be talking about those soon. A uh, couple thermal imaging cameras that I've been using over the last couple months. We'll be talking about those soon. Um, bunch of Sporlin posters and different things that I have. Uh, obviously they're a sponsor of my videos so they send me all kinds of cool stuff to put on the walls. Uh, some components. You know I've gone through a little phase where I cut up uh, components, that's an SDR valve, uh, a couple dryers that I cut open, receiver, um, pressure regulating valves, liquid line solenoid valve, all kinds of stuff back in here. Um, I've got all kinds of various videos, a couple more valves that I cut apart right here, expansion valve, head pressure control valve, took apart a recovery cylinder to show the dip tube, um, just various books. Uh, everybody asks me what book I recommend right here. Commercial Refrigeration for Air Conditioning Technicians by Dick Wurz. Hands down the best refrigeration book out there. Some great, great information. Uh, Sporland, you know, beer cups. Lots of questions on these cars up in here. These are not typical models. These are actually made out of Legos. My daughter made them for me. Um, I just use them as decoration in my office. An old charging cylinder. I never use that charging cylinder, but um, there's really not much fancy to my office. It's just a normal little office. There's the view outside my window, the neighbor's house over there, um, little garden right here, that fancy stuff. I usually don't have that open when I'm streaming. I just have it open for ventilation right now. Um, kind of wasted space back there because I have my computer tables pushed all the way back, but some studio lights, some more spoiling posters. Um, Roadcaster Pro mixing board. This is awesome. If you guys are doing any podcasting or anything like that, I highly recommend the Roadcaster Pro. You can do multi-inputs, um, XLR inputs, uh, you can have Bluetooth phone connection, um, plug-in phone connection, you can do computer audio, um, you can do boards. So when I do my live streams, the intro to my live stream, I hit these pads and it does my intro music and my outro music and the beer pour and all that stuff. I use Streamlabs OBS for streaming my uh, live stream. Um, we're getting ready to go live right now, soon, in about 40 minutes or so for my uh, live stream on March 30th, 2020. So that'll be getting ready. Um, before every live stream, I come up with like a list of topics of things that I want to talk about. So I got that list set up. I still have to go through and do a few more things. Um, I use a stream deck for pulling up different websites. Obviously, don't use it to its full potential. But a stream deck, essentially, if I just hit a button on there, like for instance, Sporlin, boom. See, it automatically pops up their website. I talk about Sporlin's website often, so I have that queued up. Same thing with Heatcraft. Heatcraft RPD pops right up. So I really like the Stream Deck. Again, I know I'm not using it to its full potential, but at this point in time, that's what I'm using it for. So that way, when I'm doing live streams or something, if someone asks a question about something with Heatcraft, I can pull up installation manuals or Sporlin manuals or whatever. Um, nothing too fancy. I didn't spend a bunch of money on this office. These are just a bunch of Ikea desks that I just kind of pieced together and some shelves and different things like that. So nothing really too amazing. I uh, use a Dell computer, a couple hard drives to back up all my stuff. Um, use that fan actually, just, just some funny stuff. Like I use this fan for white noise because obviously I have a family. So I turn the fan on, turn it on medium and it'll usually drown out any noise that happens in the hallway of my house or anything like that. So that way you don't hear that because my microphone, I use a uh, Rode Procaster and the Procaster picks up noise all the way across the house. So 
pretty crazy. Um, there's my little setup right there when I'm streaming. The mic kind of comes over. Headphones right there. I have a second mic for when I do stuff with my wife. And occasionally she comes in and uh, she's getting ready to possibly do a podcast with her friends. So they've been coming in and recording, doing different things like that. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Just uh, spoiling wall posters. You know, uh, I actually utilize those pressure temperature charts quite often when people email me different things going through. Um, you know, I do pay attention to all the comments on my videos and different things like that. I do try to pay attention to the emails. So usually what I do is right before the live stream, um, the day of the live streams, I'll go through and I'll start uh, answering emails, sending out links to the live stream. And then uh, people are asking me questions all the time on the emails and I'll go through and, um, you know, look at the pressure temperature charts. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. My drawers are all just full of junk. There's nothing organized about my office. You open them up, there's just piles and piles of camera gear and different stuff like that. Passports, for whatever reason, are in there from a vacation. You see piles and piles of stuff. So I'm not some super perfect, fancy, whatever person. It's just a normal office in here. So. All right. That helps me to give a break for a second and... Can I, uh, or, and that answers a lot of questions that people have about the stuff in my office. I guess the one thing I didn't answer was that straight behind me, that is a training board with uh, smoke detectors on it. And uh, I do that. Those are the smoke detectors that we use in uh, package units. And we do that as a training thing for my technicians. And then I've made several videos on it. So if you just look up smoke detector on my channel, you'll see that'll come up. Um, all right, uh, let's see what else we got. Are the intelligent controllers by Heatcraft only on Larkin evaporators? No, um, Heatcraft has several different names that they've purchased over many years, Larkin, Bone, Chandler, um, and then they have the Heatcraft line. Uh, you can get the intelligent controller on all of them, as far as I know. Um, it just depends on the brand that you wanna buy. And there is no difference between Larkin, Bone, Chandler. I, I don't even know why they even have those brands. I don't even think they, distribute Chandler anymore. I think they absorbed that into one of the other ones, but they're all the same. It's all heat craft equipment. So, um, uh, the smoke detector board. Yeah. That's what I was talking about that. When did I talk about that? Just Google, uh, or, I mean, just look on my channel, just look up smoke detector and it, it, I have several videos on the smoke detector board. There's a whole 20 minute video on it. So, um, let's see. Let me see what else we got on here. All right. I got a couple more things I need to cover on my list. Um, Jason had asked me if I, if I pay attention to certifications as an employer, um, as in when I'm considering a new hire. So he's a new guy in school, he's about to be done and he's got a bunch of certifications and he wants to get more certifications and he wants to know if those are important. Okay. Here's my take on certifications. First off, let's, let's address RSES. Okay. Or let's address Nate or ESCO, any one of those certification programs. Any certification is better than no certification. Okay. Uh, I am Nate certified. Is it doing anything for me? No, absolutely not. Other than continuing my education. Any certification is better than no certification. And the reason why I say that is to maintain a Nate certification, to keep my Nate certification, I have to continue my education. I have to go to training classes. I have to provide those classes to Nate. They make sure in order to hold my certification good, I have to continue my education. So any certification is better than none. Now, as a, as a new hire coming in, does it mean anything when a new hire comes in with 57 different certifications? You know, he's Nate certified, he's RSCS or Nate certified, ready to work, all these different things. Yes and no, okay? Because I'm looking at him as a technician. So it's, it's only a plus if he has them but it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna hire him if he doesn't have certifications, okay? Because I'm looking at him as a person, his mechanical skills, his aptitude, his ability to learn all that stuff. And then if he's all you know good with all of those and I compare him to an equal tech and one of them has certifications over the other, then I'm probably gonna consider the one with certifications over the one that doesn't have any. But it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna hire a service technician, okay? So again, continue your education, get as much education as you can, um, and like I said, any certification is better than none. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, let me see what else. Um, oh, so I will address something right now. Um, I had another question and I'm going to, let me see this right here. Um, 
Okay, I have another question and someone had asked me and I said I would address it this time. So we're gonna address it right now. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna pull up something right now on my computer. Hold on just a second. And I'm gonna discuss the apps, the different types of apps that I use on my phone. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on this, but I'm just gonna go through them really quick because I've been pimping this one for a while and everybody keeps asking me, so I'm gonna do it. Um, as far as what do I use for the boom for my mic, it's just like a road thing, um, whatever road makes. It's nothing fancy. All right, let me open this up. All right, we are connected. Just one second, let me make sure I connect. And I will pull this thing up, if I can, if it works. Hold on. Let's see what we're doing here. Uh, the next question that I had, I'm going to answer that while I'm waiting for this. Do I do any fun company activities or parties? Um, I mean, occasionally we'll do like a Christmas party or something. But no, we don't go to like theme parks or anything like that. We don't play around with that much stuff. Okay, I'm going to pull up a screen share real quick and show the apps on my phone. And we're going to go through that real quick. Okay, so uh, let me go to display capture. Let me turn this off transition this over. You guys should still be able to hear me. Okay. So we're going to open up uh, the tab that has all my apps that I have on my phone. Um, here's the different ones. Now, not necessarily do I use all of these. Okay. The apps that I use all the time, I use the BlueVac app uh, very commonly when I'm using the BlueVac micro engage. Another really good one I'm going to say right now is carrier commercial literature. This is a very important app. This is, uh, you can download this on the Android Play Store or on the Apple Store. If you just input a model number to any carrier unit, and I'm trying to think of a model number right now, I can't think of one. Um, let me just type in some numbers, 8600, and see if that comes up with anything. And you do a search. Um, I don't know if that's going to come up with anything. Okay, yeah, so it's going to come up with installation manuals and service manuals. And this does obsolete ones too from many years ago. You can pull them up and it does all kinds of great information. It's a free app that Carrier has. I highly suggest you guys get that Carrier Commercial Literature. This is probably one of the best apps you can have. The Copeland Mobile app is an amazing app that you can use and it helps you to learn about compressors. So CR32, let's just type that in and you're gonna look at the compressor, really cool. You click on it, it tells you some information about it. Uh, I just found a random number, so this doesn't mean anything. But the really cool thing is you go right here to service parts. Hey, let's say that this compressor has a funky service valve or a sight glass on it or you know, you click on these and it's going to tell you the certain part. Look at that, the molded power cable. There's the part number directly from Copeland. Um, electrical parts. There's the starting components, the, 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 the factory part numbers for the starting components. This is a great, great app. The other thing that the Copeland mobile thing does is you can go to diagnostics and you can input suction pressure, discharge pressure, and current draw. And it's going to help you to say, hey, there's something wrong with this compressor. You need to investigate further. You want to know the BTUs, the sizes the information on a compressor, the electrical specs. Copeland mobile app is a great app. I highly suggest you guys all check it out if you haven't already, okay? Um, the other apps that are worth mentioning, I have a lot of supply house app. The Field Piece Job Link app is another great app. Um, don't know why I have the iManifold app on here. I haven't used that in a long time. Zach's app, I don't think that works anymore for HVAC Shop Talk. Um, Intuit Field Service Management is our invoicing program that we use. I have the HVAC School app. Um, measure quick. That's one that I use all the time. We have a QR reader. Um, Tecumseh is an app just like the Copeland mobile one. Train 360 is another great app right here um, that you can look up information for all the train equipment. You guys, that's a really good one. United Refrigerations app. Um, we go down here. Uh, there's the thermostat app for my house. I can pull that up. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, oh, see, look at that. It won't show the app because it's protected information. See, my, my, my I was wondering if it was going to show my street name because I think that's the name of my app, my thermostat, and it didn't. Um, let's see, Train360, I already said that. Fleur Tools, Linux Prodigy app is another good one for those of you guys that work on Linux. The Parts Town app is another amazing app because it has a resource of tons of manuals on the Prodigy app. Great, great app, guys. Highly suggest that one. Uh, the Sporlin Chillmaster PT app, it's pressure temperature charts. That's a really important one. That one helps out. The Ohm's Law Calculator, surprisingly, I use quite often, actually. That's a good app, too. Linux Pros, you get lots of great information. You can order parts, and you get part numbers and manuals from Linux. That's an amazing app. Um, Screen Recorder, I use that when I'm working with my uh, um, videos and stuff quite often. You guys probably see screen-recorded apps on there. Um, so that's the basic apps on my phone. Um, 
for those that have been wondering about the apps that I use. Um, let me see. Let me close this down and get back to the normal streaming. We'll exit that. Okay, cool. All right. Um, let me pull up my list of things to talk about, and we'll get back to that. Um, so, uh, Jameson or James had asked me about what supermarket work is like, and I can't fairly answer that question because I've never done supermarket refrigeration. Okay. I have some ideas though. Okay. Uh, first off, um, you better be ready to work if you're going to do supermarket refrigeration. Now I have a bunch of friends that do supermarket refrigeration, uh, rookie refrigeration. He has a YouTube channel. He does supermarket refrigeration. And then also, um, let's see. Yeah, I would check out Rookie Refrigeration's channel. That's definitely a good one. Um, and he does a lot of the supermarket refrigeration videos. Uh, and he could probably answer some questions. I don't think he's in here today. His name's Ruben. But you better be ready to work. Okay, you're going to work long hours. Uh, the money's going to be good when you're in the supermarket work, definitely. But um, you're going to not be home very much. That's the biggest thing. Okay, as far as technical, you're going to be working on some technical stuff. You're going to be de-icing cases a lot. That's going to be a big thing you're going to be doing. Um, there's lots of potential for opportunity in the supermarket side because uh, with the advent of the CO2 refrigeration becoming very popular, that's a whole new thing. You got the control system. So supermarket's going to have guys that do controls, guys that do the refrigeration work, and then you're going to have a mixture of both. Um, there's companies that do install, service, all that stuff, okay? So supermarket's another aspect. There's, there's tons of different sectors of this industry that we have, okay? But supermarket is a good one. Just be ready to work and work a lot, okay? Long hours for sure. The overtime calls are going to come in all the time. Um, is there a difference between a Paragon and a Graslin defrost clock for setting times, defrost times? Well, they're different styles of time clocks. The Graslin style is an electromechanical that, um, you know, has little plastic dials and uh, plastic little dip switches for setting the, the the defrost. Okay, and on a Paragon one, it's going to be more of an electric or a, a, more of a mechanical, what I call a mechanical control, and you're going to be able to see the switching action on it. As far as setting the defrost times, I mean, on a Paragon, it's a little bit different. Yeah, you move a dial around the actual clock face, and on the Graslin, you flip a dip switch around the clock face. So. Um, Honeywell PT. Oh, right on, Ralph. Yeah, I have used the Honeywell PT app, Ralph. I've used that too. Uh, I don't know if it was on my phone or not, but yeah, I definitely have used it. So I'll check it out. I'll double check to make sure I didn't miss it. Um, let me see what else. Uh, have any updates on my tool channel? No, you, you know, Adam, I just, it's not, I'm just going to kind of do it whenever I have time for a video. So it's not going to be something I'm going to be uploading two videos a week or anything like that. So no, I want to do some more videos. And I, again, I, I have the, I, I filmed them a bunch of times, but I just wasn't happy with them. But I have the, the thermal imaging one and the Sporlin Smart Pro R tools, um, the field piece. I'm going to review those. There's, there's lots of different stuff. I just need to do it. So, um, have I, have any of us worked on chillers or heat pumps? I don't do any chiller work, but I work on heat pumps quite often. So yes, I do. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Um, okay, Andy had asked, uh, he had sent me an email asking me about the BlueVac uh, Micron gauge. And the BlueVac Micron gauge is, is an amazing Micron gauge. I use it myself. But he was saying that he noticed compared to, and I'm paraphrasing his question, so forgive me if I'm butchering it, Andy. But he noticed that compared to some of the other Micron gauges that the BlueVac is a lot more jumpy. It's a lot more precise. And... Um, he tends to notice that, you know, when he does his decay test, that it rises right away, you know, as opposed to the other micron gauges. Okay. So one thing I do know is that the blue vac, first off, Jim Bergman just released a video on the measure quick channel explicitly explaining all of this stuff. Okay. So I'm kind of paraphrasing what he's said and what I've heard him say, but blue vac has designed their micron gauge to be hyper precise. Okay. Very, very precise. Um, I have heard this from many people that previous manufacturers of micron gauges in the past designed into the algorithm that they did not react very fast as far as microns rising and different things like that. For instance, there was a micron gauge manufacturer, I'm not going to name them, that wouldn't show a micron change. It would basically only show 100 microns at a time. So 100, 200, 300, 400, it wouldn't show the in-between, okay? Um, so they designed them that way to make, you know, for whatever reason. So a lot of people think that, oh my gosh, I get this blue vac one and it's like, 
you know, it, it drops really fast or it rises really fast. Well, there's probably something wrong with your system or you're not paying attention to a lot of different things. Like for instance, on your core tool, when you turn it, you actually introduce pressure into the system because it's stuck around the ball in the ball valve. And so oftentimes what I'll do when I'm pulling down a system is I'll leave the core shutoff tool like in a mid seated position. So that way it's pulling from all around it. Okay. Also in the blue vac video that Jim Bergman released, he said something about the, uh, Schrader cores not being depressed all the way. That's another really important thing. Now I know I didn't completely answer your question, Andy, but I know that you're going to get an answer when you watch that video from Jim. So hopefully that takes care of that. Um, Carl, Carl, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. That is awesome. Uh, you wanted to say residential. Thank you for my videos. And Oh, no problem, man. I really, really appreciate it. And I wish I made more residential videos for you, but all right. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Um, when I was first starting out, how long was it before I was on my own? Um, uh, my dad put me out on my own pretty quick. Uh, I'd say within a couple months I was out driving around by myself, uh, very uncomfortably, um, getting involved in equipment and stuff. But you also have to understand something that I grew up in this trade. I grew up working for my father and I literally from elementary school through junior high worked every summer. So I kind of already had a knowledge. And when I officially came to work for him in 2002, I was still nervous, but I had a general understanding of refrigeration and air conditioning. So it's not like he completely threw me to the wolves, but I do things a little bit differently now. So, um, let me see what else. Um, what do I think about 5G? I'm not too worried about it. I have no control over it. What am I going to do? I mean, yeah, first off, I've heard that um, the real 5G, uh, this is something I heard a tech guy talking about it. Real 5G actually isn't going to come out for a very long time. What they're installing right now is just a modified 4G. Um, the actual legit 5G is what I heard. I don't know this to be true. Is going to be a long time before it's actually out. Um, what they're doing right now, what everybody thinks that they're doing is, is like a modified 4G is what I heard. So, um, is blue on the next big thing for us in HVACR? No, blue on is just another refrigerant. Uh, there's many manufacturers that make refrigerants. I have nothing bad to say about blue on's product because I've never used it, but are they the next big thing in HVACR? No, they're just a manufacturer of refrigerant. So, um, let me see what else we got in here. What am I missing? Yeah. Um, what should you make for your lunch tomorrow? Not HVAC related bill. I don't know, Bill. Don't know. You know what, Bill? I'm not talking to you. Our internet beef is going on because I need to get paid more for the overtime show. So, you know, Bill, you and I are dead to each other until I get a raise. So, all right. Does it show more potential dedication when my employees buy more essential tools? Of course, when my employees, I, it shows more dedication. I mean, we buy a lot of their big tools, but yeah, if they buy a good meter and a good manifold set or buy the field piece job link probes and show interest in that, yeah, it shows me that they're interested in learning for sure. Um, what is the next big thing? I have no idea. I mean, honestly, in HVAC, we're rolling back on big things like VRF. We went to VRF. This is the thing that's becoming popular, but VRF is no different other than the circuit boards that we put in them. Um, we're kind of going back to totally piped systems. See, we used to have systems that had miles and miles of refrigeration piping. And then we went away from that. We went to chillers and, you know, where we were moving fluid instead of refrigerant through the building, liquids and different things. And then now we're kind of going back to these systems that have miles and miles of pipe. So I don't know. I mean, we, we kind of go back and forth. Yeah, we have new elect electronics that make these systems work better. But um, does the Paragon defrost clock terminals get loose? Where did I miss that question? Uh, did it disappear? I think the question just disappeared. Sorry. I think you retracted your question when I was reading it. Um, HVACR. Nor oh, okay. So I mentioned that one. Okay. So um, at this point right now, I'm not going to play with the whole fake encore thing. We're just going to stop talking about refrigeration and air conditioning. So consider this your guys' encore. All right. I'm not going to drink this whole water, but we're going to kind of go ahead and talk about whatever. Um, I am genuinely, you know, I don't know what you guys believe about the virus and all this different stuff. And I, you know, I was kind of raised to believe authority and everything, but I'm like, I'm so done with this thing. I'm ready just to accept my fate. I said this in the beginning, but I'm just ready to get back to work. You know, I just want things to get back to normal. And, um, we, I, I said earlier in the stream that we had friends over this weekend and it was super chill. It was so nice to have friends over. They were, they were here. They came over. We went to the farmer's market. We went shopping together. We came home, we spent all day barbecuing, 
hung out in the backyard. Man, there was it was so nice to just hang out. One thing I will say, I think, is that, you know, because we've been stuck at home for so long, it definitely made that experience with our friends that much more enjoyable because we longed for it, right? And then we got it. That was super cool. Um, yeah, Rogue doesn't bottle water. No, they don't. Trust me, I'm, I'm good on Rogue. I, I was hitting that all weekend, so. But yeah, I'm just ready to get get back to things, man. Everything's just so messed up, um, you know, but yeah. How are you guys doing with everything? So, um, Ike, am I going to come back to Missouri at some point and enjoy the weather where, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I mean, I could, I could move back to Missouri. I could live there. I could live a country lifestyle for sure. My family couldn't, though. My family is beach. They want to be at the beach all the time. Even though, ironically, we don't go to the beach that much. So, yeah. Um, let me see. Yeah, we're just so first. Am I a music person? Do I play any instruments or in interested in taking any up? Adam Neal, um, I wish that I could play an instrument. I, I can't really multitask very well. As a kid, I used to take guitar lessons, um, but I did not retain any of it. I would love to be able to play an instrument. My daughter is much more musically inclined than myself. Um, I, I really would, I think that would be a dream of mine to be able to play the guitar, that that is something that I want. I enjoy music though, for sure. I, I enjoy so much music. That's one of my passions is music and movies. I just love to listen to music and watch movies. In fact, we watched back to the future today, um, with my wife, she sat down with me and it'd been so many years since I watched back to the future from start to finish. It's like, wow, this is a really cool movie. It's fun to see all the little things in there. Um, have I ever worked on 134A freezers that run in a vacuum? Yes, I have. Um, we're not going to go too technical with the HVAC stuff because this is the point where I'm just going to talk about BS right now. But yes, I have worked on that. Um, you don't think Florida was uh, that bad for the COVID? I, I think I trust that it's real and I believe that it was. I'm not denying that COVID isn't real. I just think uh, it was a little bit overhyped. But to an extent, I, f I also agree that it wasn't as bad as they said it was going to be because we were, you know, staying home and stuff. So I do agree that we did what we did for a reason, but I'm just kind of ready to kind of get back to normal now. Um, Chris is a world renowned flutist. Yeah, I'm a pianist. I'm a pianist. Pianist. I want to be a pianist. All right. Uh, imagine. Yeah, we haven't stopped at all. Yeah, we stopped for sure. Everything kind of hit the fan. Uh, what is my thoughts about piece rate versus hourly pay for service? Uh, send me an email, bud. We'll talk about it more. Um, Band of Brothers for Memorial Day. That's a good one. Um, I probably didn't acknowledge Memorial Day either. Um, you know, uh, I think that we all kind of forget the reason for the holiday. And obviously, we're honoring our fallen soldiers. Um, and I do, you know, without getting political or anything, uh, you got to give respect to the guys that aren't here with us anymore because they did what they had to do or what they were told to do. Um, you know, whether you, you know, to protect us or whatever it is, I mean, um, you got to give props to that. And, uh, I think that we don't honor these. We, we, we see it as a holiday. We see it as a day to just, yes, we get another day off. And even I'm guilty of that too, you know? Um, but it's a, it's a very important day that we do need to reflect on those that have been lost and given their lives for our country, whether you agree with those things or not, you know, we're honoring those people, not necessarily the reason they were there. And, uh, I think it's very important that we, we need to kind of reflect on that a little bit more. So, um, let's see. If I moved back to Missouri, I would so, oh yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't, if I, if I moved out of California, I wouldn't run my own company anymore. Um, definitely wouldn't want run my own company anymore. So, uh, am I into any sports? No, I've never been a sports person. I, I enjoy watching sports. Um, but I'm, ne I've never played sports. Never really, never really into it. Um, I've always been an outdoors person, camping, hiking, that kind of stuff. So, um, let me see what else I miss it. Do I think there's going to be a second wave of the virus? Well, yeah, I think that if, if, I mean, it's, you, if you understand, I mean, this is going to be a permanent thing that's going to be around forever. You know, even if they have a vaccine, there's still going to be some sort of it around. I mean, so yeah, it's going to come back. It's, it's going to, you know, it's, it's a coronavirus, very similar to the common cold or the flu. So it's going to be around no matter what, um, it, my opinion. So, uh, yeah, all of our governors want to extend the lockdown, but they're extending it down here too. So yeah, it's crazy. Um, let me see. Uh, steaks or fried chicken? 
Ooh, that is a hard one, man. I don't really eat fried chicken anymore because of the guilt of fried chicken, but but I, I love fried chicken. But I tell you what, though, last night I grilled a steak that was insane, like probably one of the best steaks I've ever grilled. Um, so I went to our local farmer's market and they have, uh, they, they have like prime grass fed, whatever beef or whatever. And I bought a couple ribeyes and on Saturday I cut up one of the ribeyes, the small one, and we used it for kebabs cause I wanted to just test out how tender the meat was. But these ribeyes guys, gosh, I need to pull up a picture. They were so flipping tender. Actually, I'm going to pull up a picture right now and show you how freaking awesome the marbling was in this ribeye because it was insane. Give me a second and I'm going to pull this up because I do have a picture in my phone. So one second, let me turn this on. Um, but yeah, I enjoy both. I just don't eat fried chicken as much just because I'm like, I feel guilty about it. Um, but yeah, so let me pull up my gallery and let me pull this up and wait till you see this ribeye right now. Hold on just a second. I don't know if I can get, yeah, I can get that to disappear. So I'm going to screen share right now. This is before I cooked it, but look at the marbling in this thing, man. This was a bone in ribeye. It was flipping awesome. All right. So I'm going to transition that out, transition that over. Look at that thing, man. You can't tell me that's not amazing looking with that marbling in there. That steak was epically awesome. Um, now if I can figure out how to transition over, uh, shrimp steak that ribeye was flipping awesome cooked perfect medium rare right there absolutely perfect epic right there that was an epic uh sunday dinner right there sitting out at the barbecue with the family really really awesome so i'm super blessed to be able to do that and be able to have a day with my family was was freaking awesome so let's pull this back up transition this back over all right let's see what else yeah, that was an amazing steak. So, uh, yeah, it's got to be, I'm, I'm a medium rare kind of a person on a steak like that. I had to go more medium rare. Usually I'm more medium, but yeah, I definitely had to go. Yeah. A little bit more rare. So, uh, nah, see, I'm not a T-bone person. I did see Ralph's steak, but I'm, I'm more of a, a ribeye ribeye is better. I like the marbling in there. The marbling gives it so much better flavor to me for my thing. So, um, let me see what else I'm missing in here. Yeah, yeah, I guess you can call it a hair too thin, but I thought it was perfect. So, um, do I have a favorite car? Uh, I have a dream car and it's that VW bus. Um, I, I would love to have a VW bus. That is one of my dream cars. So yeah, watermelon was good for sure. Um, definitely awesome. All right, gents, it is that time I need to eat dinner. Uh, we're not going to do an encore cause this was my encore. So I'm really, really leaving for real. Um, really, really appreciate you guys coming into the stream. It was definitely an awesome time. If I didn't answer your guys' questions, please feel free to send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Uh, do me a favor and, uh, support the stream. Uh, if you guys are considering purchasing any tools, go to truetechtools.com and use my offer code, big picture, one word, you can save 8% on your order. Definitely helps to support it. Um, that would be awesome if you guys could do this. And, uh, hopefully I will see you guys on Friday on the overtime show. So long as, uh, work doesn't get too messed up and stuff. Okay. And I don't have to work too hard. Um, I will catch you guys on the next one. If I can actually have this intro picture transitioned up to transition over. And again, this is the real one. So I'm out. Okay. Catch you guys later. One thing, if y'all could take one thing from my videos or my live streams, please stop, take a second, take a step back and look at the big picture.